there's a fighter pilot out there in the history books that isn't very well known by the layman. But those that do know of him know that he was an amazing marksman that had a bit of an attitude problem. His name was Hans Mercer. Some would argue, however, that an abnormal attitude is a run-of-the-mill trait for a fighter pilot, and that's exactly the type of person that you would want at the stick. And there's a list out there that will probably never change. It's a list of the greatest fighter pilots during World War II. The most important metric on this list, number of enemy kills. Now I'm going to clue you in on something that you may or may not know already about this list. They're all Germans. In fact, a quick glance at the first 30, and there's no end in sight as to when another country joins the ranks. One of the main reasons for Nazi dominance on this list is the amount of combat time that these men were exposed to. They started fighting very early in the late 1930s. American forces didn't even arrive in Europe until January of 1942, and by that time, German pilots already had three years of dogfighting experience over the U.S. At the peak of the war, Germany had more machines than men. The same men were constantly flying over and over again. It wasn't uncommon for an Allied force to shoot down an ME-109, witness the pilot's parachute open, and then have that same downed pilot jump right back into an airplane and start fighting again. We all know of men like Chuck Yeager, Bob Hoover, Robin Olds, But why not Hans Marseille? Why do we as enthusiasts not hear his name more often as one of the most skilled fighter aces during World War II? Is it because he flew for the Luftwaffe and not the good old U.S. of A.? Well, not really. There are plenty of us out there that know the name Eric Hartman, who flew for the Luftwaffe and was responsible for 352 kills. So why not Hans? Well, as it turns out, he is pretty well known, just not at the top of that list that I was talking about. As a matter of fact, he doesn't even make the top 30 as far as number of kills is concerned. But he did make a lasting impression that made even the greatest of pilots question how Marseille was able to do some of the things that he could do with an airplane. A lot of Royal Air Force aviators would look up at Hans's BF-109 flying along all by its lonesome after ditching his wingman, eager to add another notch to their belts by leisurely ganging up on this little fish. But not many of these Brits could have imagined that they weren't the shark and that this little fish would turn on an instant and show his teeth. One witness accounted Marseille on approach to land after a combat mission when he was jumped by five Royal Air Force Hawker Hurricanes Marseille cleaned up his 109, did an about-face, and downed two of them before chasing off the other three. Hans Joachim Marseille was born in Berlin, Germany on December 3rd, 1919. His father was a fighter pilot in World War I. You could say that he already had it in his genes to be an accomplished fighter pilot, but he was surrounded from the very beginning by good mentors and competitors when he arrived in fighter pilot school in Vienna. One of his instructors was none other than Julius Arigi, an Austro-Hungarian fighter ace from World War I credited with 32 aerial victories. One of his classmates, Werner Schroer, ended the war with 114 kills, even though he started his tenure as a member of the ground staff. Werner, when asked about Hans, was quoted saying, telling Marseille that he was grounded was like telling a child that he couldn't go outside and play. This should give you some insight as to his temperament during his tour with the Luftwaffe. Marseille was first deployed in 1940. His assignment was to defend a chemical plant in Loena, Germany, during the onset of the war. But once France was officially occupied, he was reassigned to a fighter group in Calais, France. 
His very first of 151 aerial victories came during the Battle of Britain over the English Channel. During a dogfight with RAF pilots, Marseille chose to abandon his wingmen to engage on his own, leaving his fellow wingmen without any protection. He splashed his opponent and hightailed it low over the water back to the base. In another instance, after being advised to disengage, he repeated his actions by deserting his fellow pilots and jumping into a dogfight while being completely outnumbered. Yet again, another example writes that he spotted the enemy moving in on his wing commander once more he was told not to engage. Do you think he followed orders? I think you're starting to understand a trend with this guy. You're right. He engaged anyways and single-handedly eliminated several enemy fighters before everyone dispersed. Now, I imagine he flew home with a smile on his face, imagining the crowd and the applause around his airplane, but none of that happened. This is where his reputation of normalization of defiance began, and he wasn't winning the confidence of anyone in his group. Not his commanders, and certainly not his fellow pilots. And why should they? It's like going into battle with your sword and your mighty steed to fight alongside your fellow Romans, and then suddenly having them bow out and say, nah, we're good, you're on your own, I'm going to go over here and pick on these guys instead. Because of this behavioral trend, he was actually passed up for promotions quite a few times. Now, as the months rolled on, he claimed more victories. After victory number seven, he lost an engine out by Thaville. He was forced into landing on a beach with his landing gear up, and, and there are pictures online. And given the damp conditions on the beach, it was actually pretty impressive how he kept the airplane intact as he slid to a stop. Not long after... He was transferred to Stuttgart, where he claimed four more victories. His lifestyle continued. He was quite the womanizer, quite the drinker, and often performed both of these hobbies simultaneously. A playboy and a loose cannon is what he was referred to. It didn't exactly sound like he was turning over a new leaf anytime soon. He still wasn't gaining anyone's trust, and anyone riding along with him on this train could see the engine seizing in the near future. But as it turns out, all Hans needed was to be put in the right environment. Marseille's lethal instrument of warfare at altitude was the Messerschmitt BF-109. To this day, there aren't many of these airplanes left flying in the world. In fact, I can think of one or two airworthy 109s in Duxford. And that's all that I can come up with off the top of my head. The ones that are left flying are quoted by pilots as being an interesting combination of archaic 1930s technology and ingenious engineering. And those aren't my words, by the way. I get that from Flight Journal magazine on an article they wrote on Hans Marseille, and I would highly recommend it. It's very well done. But Hans was the perfect fit for this airplane. His small stature paired perfectly with the confined, almost claustrophobic cockpit. Before the engine is even started, one must check their seat position before closing the canopy. If your seat position is too high, you'll get clonked on the head by the canopy when you close it. So open the canopy back up and adjust your seat accordingly. The last thing you want to do is not have your seat in the correct position prior to engine start. The airplane did not like being on the ground. In fact, if you hung around the ground too long with that engine running, the coolant in the wing-mounted radiators would start to overheat. Veteran pilots knew that as soon as the engine turned over, it needed to head to the air with haste. Off these pilots went, bouncing and rattling along the grass to taxi into position. Forward visibility is absolutely horrendous in the 109, so weaving side to side with a tailwheel configuration is a must. During what they call a static engine run-up, the coolant in the wing-mounted radiators continues to heat up. Operators in Germany back in the day would see temperatures over 100 degrees before takeoff roll. Imagine how quickly and how much higher that temperature would rise in Marseille's primary combat environment in North Africa. From the moment that engine cranks, he was practically in the skies. Once in the sky, it flies like a dream. The ME-109 had the capability of turning very tight, especially 
with Marseille at the stick. Under normal circumstances, the Spitfire was the tightest turning airplane in the European theater. But Marseille's method, much to the RAF's surprise, would often have him use flaps, which is not procedurally recommended. He would do this at very low air speeds to aid in his tight turns during a dogfight, resulting in a startling surprise for the RAF pilots. Speaking of turning tight, pilots in the Grumman Wildcats and Corsairs in the Pacific Theater were often warned of their adversary, the Japanese Zero. Rule number one, don't get slow when fighting the Zero because it'll outturn you every time. In fact, a common technique when flying a Wildcat with a Zero on your tail was to hold the stick as far forward as you could while placing the elevator trim in the full up position. Once the trim gets to the stop, you let go of the stick. And by the time the blood rushed back into your head and you woke up again, the zero wasn't on your tail anymore. I often wondered if allies joined differently at the start of the conflict, what it would have looked like with a zero and a 109 in a dogfight. With the right pilots, I'm sure it would have been quite the awe-striking show. But yet another transfer in December of 1940, put Marseille in western Germany, but that was short-lived. The entire group was quickly relocated to North Africa. This is where his true, long-lasting reputation as a world-class fighter pilot with his BF-109 would begin. Try to imagine North Africa for just a moment. It was like training grounds in the United States, but better. Bright, Barren lands of sand butted up tightly against the contrast of the deep blue Mediterranean. The visibility for an aviator was absolutely perfect. Not at all like England, which was the polar opposite. Bomber and fighter pilots would train in the United States in territories that produced flawless weather. This way, they could carry out training on a daily basis without any delay. Suddenly, they were plunged into wet, cold snowy, icy England, to which many of them responded, we have to fly in this crap? The North African skies were an amazing opportunity for a skillful fighter pilot with uncanny eyesight. Enter Hans Marseille. Water on the coast, sand on terra firma, each with minimal texture. If you can see anything moving along either scape, you have the initial advantage. For Hans, having these advantages helped to offset his myriad of health issues. As a young boy, Marseille was weak. There was a time during his young life where he almost died from influenza. He continued, though, into his adult life with his frail body. Most fighter pilots in North Africa unfortunately couldn't escape jaundice. It was commonplace in that region, at least initially for most officers. Marseille was often seen rolling in after combat, not having the ability to open his canopy. Ground crew would climb onto his wing, open his canopy, and assist in lighting his cigarette due to his weak and shaky hands not having the strength or the dexterity to strike the match. A couple of puffs and he would be assisted out of his seat. He would walk under his own power across the dirt, headed for the latrine, where he would spend the majority of his day. He would emerge hours later, walking to his airplane for another combat mission with blood on the back of his pants. And this was a sign of amoebic dysentery, and it often wouldn't subside without some sort of medical leave. Hans loved the dogfight, but he hated the idea of a man associated with the machine he was up against. Shooting someone out of the sky didn't feel good. For him, it was great sport. Man versus machine not man versus man. Downing an opponent never felt 100% satisfying for Hans unless he was given the relief of seeing a canopy emerge from one of his bested opponents. Marseille had the ability to keep his actions from completely divorcing the consequences. An example of his moral compass emerged on May 30th, 1941. Marseille, while claiming his 65th victory of a P-40 Warhawk, flown by Graham George Buckland of the 250th RAF Squadron, saw his adversary bailing out of his airplane. Upon exiting his broken ship that Marseille had dominated, his body struck the tail of his own plane. Marseille watched 
as Buckland fell to his death without opening his parachute. The mangled P-40 landed over Allied lines, but the pilot landed in German territory. Marseille marked his grave, collected his papers to verify his identity, and then flew them to Buckland's airfield to deliver a letter of regret. Buckland had died two days before his 21st birthday. This is the type of man that Marseille truly was. Aerial combat wasn't a vengeful practice for him. He was simply doing his duty. Some would say that he had a great personality for an Army Air Corps fighter pilot. He certainly did love his American jazz music. More on that in a little bit. Because of Marseille's perpetually poor health, he was often flown back to Germany for medical care. Now, these were the months where his contributions in combat were truly recognized. During one of his medical leaves, which lasted roughly three weeks, his unit only managed to score one combat victory. Marseille, exhausted and not fully healed, returned to do the majority of the group's heavy lifting. He would average roughly 15 victories per month on his own and would ultimately be responsible for 96% of the unit's total victories in the air. It was clear that without Hans, the Luftwaffe's presence in Africa would amount to almost zero. This caused him to draw quite a bit of attention and popularity. He was featured in flyers and magazines, making him a celebrity back at home. His celebrity status drew recognition, and he was soon invited to the home of Willy Messerschmitt, who was the head of the company that designed and produced the second most manufactured airplane of World War II, the BF-109. This airplane was, of course, the airplane which Marseille flew. Now, the reason for his invitation was, first and foremost, his reputation as a high-scoring ace, both for the Luftwaffe as well as his squadron. Second, he was a gifted pianist. Adolf Hitler himself was in attendance that night, and when asked to play a number for all of the guests, Hans immediately began to play American jazz. Shortly after starting, Hitler stood up, raised his arms, and said, I think we've heard enough. At another gala in Berlin, there are rumors that Marseille began to hear talks and whispers of something referred to as the final solution. During all of his fame, he continually refused pressure to join the Nazi party. He even attempted to defect from Germany once while AWOL in Italy. Could he have heard details and plans for concentration camps spreading throughout Germany? Maybe so, but it was clear that through increased exposure, he showed a continued lack of support for his regime. He sure was a rebel. In fact, he was once seen strafing in front of his commander's tent. You heard me right. Marseille once stole a commander's vehicle, going AWOL again with women and liquor at his side. He even landed once on the Autobahn during a combat mission to relieve himself, and then took off moments later to continue combat. After being reprimanded for these and countless other actions, he proceeded to hop in his 109, take off, drop down low over the base, and strafe bullets outside of his commander's tent. Quite the rebel indeed. Normally, this kind of behavior would cause the powers that be to confine you to a room with minimal lighting for an undetermined time frame. But the unarguable need for his skill kept him from such punishment. Hans had an amazing eye for breaking up almost impenetrable defensive strategies. The United States Army Air Corps, along with the Royal Air Force, would often fly something called Lufberry Circles, otherwise known as the Lufberry Wheel. It was derived from World War I pilot Raoul Lufberry. Apparently, he didn't come up with a name, but he trained many pilots in the United States, and it is believed to have been passed down by those pilots. The maneuver was structured like this. It would be composed of airplanes and constant turns all in series. One airplane would be in a constant turn and the other would cover the tail of that airplane in the same constant rate turn. The same method can also be used for strafing the enemy. For instance, if multiple aircraft are engaged simultaneously on an armed supply train, each aircraft 
would take their turn firing on the train. The train's occupants would be so overly consumed with taking cover as the next fighter in line would drop into strafe. In other words, you wouldn't dare attack a group of fighters in a Lufberry circle engaged in attacking a train or a trench or simply flying defensively, as dropping in on the tail of a fighter would mean that there is one immediately on your own tail. It would be like bringing a knife to a gunfight. Nobody in their right mind would deliberately do this unless you were Hans Marseille. Hans would drop into a dive into the middle of a circle, reduce the airspeed rapidly by dropping his flaps to increase lift. But in this configuration, the pitch or quote-unquote deck angle of his 109 would be extremely high, so much so that he would actually lose sight of his target underneath his nose. He would lead his target based on instinct and hit the target with minimal rounds fired every time. He would then trade altitude for airspeed, leaving the circle rapidly, and use this energy to continuously repeat the maneuver. A wingman of Marseille's, Rainier Potion, reported on witnessing him during these maneuvers. He quotes, All the enemy were shot down by Marseille in a turning dogfight. As soon as he shot, he needed only to glance at the enemy airplane. His pattern of gunfire began at the front, the engine's nose, and consistently ended in the cockpit. How he was able to do this, not even he could explain. With every dogfight, he would throttle back as far as possible. This enabled him to fly tighter turns. His expenditure of ammunition in the air battle was 360 rounds, 60 per aircraft shot down. Now, this type of risky activity can only last so long before Murphy's Law begins to kick in. On May 13th, 1942, Marseille had a near-death experience. While flying with a wingman, he again decided to break away and pounce on 12 Curtis Kitty Hawks, all on his own. While in the scramble, after downing one of the Kitty Hawks, Marseille was hit in the oil tank and the propeller. Now, anyone who is a pilot knows that being hit in the propeller can cause an imbalance, and even the slightest imbalance can cause severe vibrations. Despite the loss of oil pressure and the damaged propeller shaking Marseille to the degree comparable to convulsions, he still managed to down one more Kitty Hawk before bringing his aircraft home, overheating in the process, and his airplane was down for a couple of days for repairs. Now, odds would dictate that eventually your luck has to run out. On September 30th, 1942, Hans Marseille was leading a group of Stutkos on a mission. While being vectored into Allied territory, Hans spotted enemy aircraft, but nobody engaged. Around 10.30 a.m., he heard the flight leader, none other than his former classmate, Werner Schroer, call in that he had just downed a Spitfire. Upon return from the mission, Marseille's cockpit began to fill with smoke. He required guidance from his wingmen as his ability to navigate, much less see in front of him, was completely nil. Eventually, he lost all power and his airplane began losing altitude in a glide. Rainier Potion was there as one of the wingmen that day. He was able to inform Hans when he crossed back over into German territory. Marseille's final words were, I've got to get out. I can't stand it any longer. Hans rolled the airplane inverted as standard procedure dictates for bailout. Unfortunately, due to the smoke obscuring his vision, he didn't notice that he was in a near vertical dive at the time. He inched his way out of the cockpit and found himself caught in the 400 mile per hour relative wind from the steep dive and struck the tail of his airplane and his chute never opened. A doctor was first to arrive on the scene. His report is as follows. The pilot lay on his stomach as if asleep. His arms were hidden beneath his body. As I came closer, I saw a pool of blood that had issued from the side of his crushed skull. Brain matter was exposed. I then noticed the awful wound above his hip. With certainty, this could not have come from the fall. The pilot must have slammed into the airplane when bailing out. 
I carefully turned the dead pilot over onto his back, opened the zipper of his flight jacket, and saw the knight's cross with oak leaves and swords, and I immediately knew who this was. I glanced at the dead man's watch. It had stopped at 11.42. It is argued by many enthusiasts that Hans Joachim Marseille was possibly the greatest World War II fighter pilot that had ever lived. He claimed over 151 kills during his tour of duty. Though some of his claimed victories were disputed, he still earned 43% of Eric Hartman's 352 victories in only one and a half years of combat. This does not include Marseille's numerous medical leaves that caused him to be absent from combat for half of his tenure. It was soon made clear that he was the only one holding his unit together and Marseille's squadron in North Africa was disbanded shortly after his death. If he would have survived the war and if he would have continued his trend of aerial victories, he might have fought his way to the very top of that list. Two things are evident. He would have made one hell of an airman for the United States. While another certainty makes itself abundantly clear, it is fortunate that he didn't make his way to the European theater from 1943 to 1945. The outcome may not have changed because of one soldier, but life for the Allied forces would have been a heck of a lot more complicated. Hey everyone, I didn't want to interrupt your listening in the middle of the show, so I thought I'd put this at the end. I just wanted to take a brief moment and thank each and every one of you for listening to Warbirds. Now, as you already know, this show airs every two weeks. But if you want to narrow that down to once per week, there is a way. There's a members-only site of mine located on Patreon. And for $5 a month, you can gain access to two additional shows every month that regular Apple or Google subscribers won't have access to. I'll put a link in the show notes for you to make it easy to get there. Along with these members-only ad-free episodes, you'll gain early access to the regularly published bi-weekly episodes. In addition to that, you'll get a special sneak peek at upcoming episodes in the queue. I'll even be taking suggestions from members as to the topics that you want to hear. So if you're hungry for more stories and two stories per month just won't tide you over, go ahead and download the Patreon app on your device. That's P-A-T-R-E-O-N or the link in the show notes and sign up for a free account. Once you've signed up, search for Warbirds and you'll find the show pretty quickly. $5 a month will give you double the amount of shows and lots more. With your support, it'll give me a lot more time to focus on producing quality shows for you, and it'll keep me out of the air and at home more often, which I'm sure my wife would appreciate as well. So thanks so much again for supporting Warbirds, everyone, and we'll see you again soon.